So our first speaker is Alicia Garza. She's an organizer, writer, and freedom dreamer, living and working in Oakland, California. She's the Special Projects Director for the National Domestic Workers Alliance, the nation's leading voice for dignity and fairness for the millions of domestic workers in the United States, most of whom are women. She's also the co-creator of At Black Lives Matters. Uh, not At, I should say. What should I say? See, boy, I, I actually do know this. I'm not that old. Hashtag. Black Lives Matter. National organizing project focused on combating anti-black state-sanctioned violence. Alicia's work challenges us to celebrate the contributions of black queer women's work within popular narratives of black movements and reminds us that the black radical tradition is long, complex, and international. Her activism reflects organizational strategies and visions that can make emerging social movements without diminishing the specificity of structural violence facing black lives. So, Alicia. Thank you, Uncle Bobby, for organizing folks to be here. It's not a light thing, y'all. It's not a light thing. These are families who are grieving the loss of their loved ones. And also, freedom dreaming at the same time. That's not an easy task, so thank you for doing it. Also, thank you to the Left Forum for having me. Um, I want to start off by talking a little bit about this moment, but I always think it's important to root this moment in history. So we don't want a historical narratives floating around out there. Uh, so the first one is maybe an obvious one, which is maybe it's not so obvious that Black Lives Matter is much more than a hashtag. In fact, it's an organized network in 26 cities globally. It's also intended to be a tactic to help rebuild the Black Liberation Movement. BLM, BLM. For this generation, including myself, we come up in a particular set of conditions and we need to understand those conditions, right? So my generation comes up during the rise of neoliberalism. My generation comes up during the rise of the war on drugs. My generation emerges during the period of the consolidation of the right wing. My generation emerges also during the rise of technology. When we talk about this movement, when we talk about is this a movement or a moment, I think we need to contextualize. Black folks have been being murdered since we were brought here. This is not a new phenomenon. It is an extension of an ongoing problem, which can be simplified to say it's the devaluation of black lives. But it can be complicated to say that it's really a part of a plan to subvert, to oppress, and in some cases, many cases, especially now, to extinguish black lives, to get rid of us. Black Lives Matter starts in 2013 when George Zimmerman was acquitted of the murder of Trayvon Martin. But again, if we root this in historical conditions, Black Lives Matter was present when Oscar Grant was murdered three blocks from my house. Black Lives Matter was present when Rodney King was brutally beaten on television in 1992, when Sean Bell was murdered on his wedding day, when Amadou Diallo was shot 41 times. 
And of course, it's not just our brothers who are being murdered. We should absolutely call the names of people like Tanisha Anderson, Miriam Carey, Shelley Fry, Yvette Smith, Rakia Boyd, Tarika Wilson, Ayanna Stanley Jones, she was seven. Pearl Underwood, she was 92. And let's not forget our transgender brothers and sisters and folks of all genders. We must call the names of people like Lamia Beard and Maya Hall, Michelle Payne and Ty Underwood, Jesse Hernandez and Penny Proud. Again, this is not a new phenomenon. Black Lives Matter also emerges, not just after Trayvon was murdered, but after the murder of Jordan Davis, the murder of Renisha McBride, after Cece McDonald was thrown in prison for defending herself against a racist and homophobic attacker, after Marissa was put in jail for defending her life. In Ferguson, frontline activists take Black Lives Matter as a slogan to describe the pain and the frustration of what it means to still be living under Jim Crow. Activists use it to inform their organizing. And then it gets adopted by the mainstream media to describe a movement against police terrorism, which is important. It's important that black lives make the news in other ways beyond our deaths and our tragedies. And at the same time, it obscures what the fight is actually about. The fight absolutely is about eradicating police violence and police terrorism. The fight is absolutely about eliminating the criminalization of black people and people of color and other oppressed peoples. But honestly, this fight is about black liberation. And if I'm to be honest with you, that cannot be relegated to a hashtag. When we created Black Lives Matter, its intent was not to be limited to narrow visions of what state violence looks like, but it was intended to encompass the struggle for human dignity and self-determination. We understand state violence as criminalization, but we also understand state violence as austerity. We understand state violence as patriarchy and white supremacy and imperialism. Let me break that down. We understand state violence as thousands of people in Detroit who lack water. Thousands of people in Baltimore who lack access to water. We understand state violence as the attack on public sector unions and on our labor movement. We understand state violence as the lack of access to quality housing, quality education, quality jobs, to a future. It's not possible for a world to emerge where Black Lives Matter if it's under capitalism. to abolish capitalism without a struggle against national oppression and gender oppression. So the fight against police terror, police violence, state violence is but one front of many. And it is our duty as human beings, as leftists, to ensure that the fight against police terror and criminalization is connected to the conditions of black communities for the sake of the reemergence of a vibrant, effective, powerful black liberation movement. Y'all don't want to know. It is essential to connect the fight against police terror and criminalization to the conditions that exist in black communities and have existed in black communities since we were brought here as slaves. For the sake of 
the reemergence of a powerful, effective, vibrant Black liberation movement. Black Lives Matter is in our tradition of call and response. It is a response to the virulent anti-Black racism and state-sanctioned violence that plagues our communities, but it is also a call to action. We hear a lot of people asking us, well, what are the demands? Who are your leaders? Look around. What are the demands? Let's start with Stop Killing Us. But again, when we connect the conditions of criminalization to the conditions in black communities, it enables us to broaden what needs to be a vibrant human rights movement. Criminalization is the way that black bodies have been forced from the formalized economy. It's also a way to subvert and abolish the black liberation movement. Our brother Mumia, our sister Asada, our brother Herman Bell, and so many more are behind bars because of the vision that they espoused. So we have to ask ourselves, why is the state so afraid of them? The simple answer is that the state is afraid because of the fundamental challenges that the Black Liberation Movement posed to the ongoing conditions of poverty and racism and patriarchy and privatization and on and on. So our fight must also be to free all political prisoners. Right. It's important that we don't reduce this fight merely to class warfare, because austerity is also a race war. As leftists, as people who care about the future of humanity, our core task is to build this movement but bigger than that, our task is to build a left. And I hate to break it to us, but we cannot replace building actual political power, economic power, social power, with slogans and newsletters. <laughs> People's movement is emerging, but is it doing so with the presence of an organized, consolidated, multi-issue, multi-tendency left that is rooted in the working class, rooted in black communities, rooted in the very people who have nothing to lose but everything to gain? But with that, there are people who are leftists who are leading this fight. And so it's important for us to ask ourselves in closing, the real kind of closing, not the reverend closing. <laughs> what are we willing to risk? Are we willing to risk everything to get closest to what we long for the most? We can't get free unless we move with rigor and vigor towards what we long for and we can't get free unless we're willing to risk it all for the sake of all of us. Thank you. Our next speaker, <coughs> excuse me, is Glenn Ford. Uh, the bio I've been given for him, and I, this is probably the bio he submitted, is way too short for someone who's accomplished so much, but here it is. Glenn is executive editor of Black Agenda Report and Black Agenda Radio. He founded the Black Commentator, which he left to found Black Agenda Report with Bruce Dixon and Margaret Kimberly. BAR provides news, commentary, and analysis from a black left perspective. If you want to get a better idea of the fullness of Glenn's biography, I urge you to go to The Real News and watch the series of interviews we did with him. It's completely fascinating, as I'm sure he is about to do. Glenn. Thanks, Paul. Good evening. Good evening. Power to the people. Power to the people. 
I'm what people used to call an old head, uh, how quickly one becomes an old head. Uh, but in the last three years, and most dramatically in the last 10 months, this old head has been moved to be overcome almost with joy to have lived to see the rebirth of a militant black movement that dares to take on the state. <laughs> to take on the state in the form of the police. I'm not talking about the state of Mississippi or the state of Georgia. And it's not just in my city or in your city. It's taking on the cops everywhere that they occupy black communities. And it's also about black cops and black police chiefs and black mayors too. So many beautiful young people, young black people and young non-black people have defied the personification of the state, the black corporate democratic president, which makes this old head very, very happy. One of my most vivid, special memories was watching the split screen on television, I think it was PBS, on the evening that the St. Louis prosecutor announced that there was not going to be any indictment of the cop that killed Michael Brown in Ferguson. On one side of the television screen was President Obama, and he was droning on and on about respect for the rule of law and other such nonsense. On the other side of the screen was a scene from Ferguson, and there were young black people milling about. And then you saw the flickering of flames on the Ferguson side of the screen. And that was the answer to the county prosecutor, and that was the answer to the President of the United States. And that was a profound political statement by people in the street that the police could no longer count on having a monopoly on the use of force. A monopoly of force that they had used and abused for two generations to build a mass black incarceration state whose mission